he gets this set up, I'll introduce myself. Um, I am Preeti Raju. I'm a product designer at One Medical. Uh, for those who don't know, One Medical is a national uh, primary care service that's very technology driven, but obviously puts our patients first. Um, I design for the member experience and I support our patients in taking ownership of their health and wellness. Uh, are any of you here One Medical members? Oh yeah, quite a few of you, this is exciting. Cool. Thank you. So uh, being in healthcare, my work as a designer goes from the in-office experience, it extends from the in-office experience to the in-app experience and all the moments in between. Um, health happens and we strive to partner with our patients, be the first call when something goes wrong and um, deliver the most memorable and most human healthcare experiences possible. And I was thinking about like the talk I could go and do with empathy and I thought of a lot of great examples, but of course, the one that stuck was an example in which I was not the most empathetic at all. So I'm gonna take us back to college, this college, but also this college. <laughs> uh, so early Facebook days when I was not very curated about the photos that I would put up. So yeah, you, you get to see this. Um, <laughs> But on a, on a more serious note, uh, I had a roommate who was wonderful um, my freshman year of college, but she always seemed to carry a weight on her shoulders. At the time, I just didn't get it. Here was this beautiful, wonderful girl, very athletic, everyone seemed to like her, and she always seemed preoccupied. And a few months into our friendship, uh, she told me that she had Crohn's disease. It's a, a chronic inflammatory bowel disease. And she'd been in and out of the hospital all through high school, and she was always very scared of a flare-up. In that moment, she was very honest and she was vulnerable. And while I listened to her story, I felt really bad for her, of course, but I just couldn't understand why she wasn't living her best life as I would have done. As I would have done, which is why that was not a very empathetic moment at all, because I tried to put on her shoes but I forgot to take my shoes off first. And I couldn't relate then, but she was just playing life at a much higher difficulty than I was at the time. It wasn't until many years later, when I'd had my own health concerns, that I was able to recognize the mental and physical turmoil she must have been going through, all while going to college too. And it was the valleys of my life where I was able to expand my capacity for empathy overall. I read this recently and I loved it, which is, what's intimately personal is universal. But that also means that our own, our own experiences give us the capacity to relate. And nowhere is that more true than in health. So think about the last time that you were at an urgent care, an ER, or even a doctor's appointment. Because I know the last time I was there, I just prayed that the bill wouldn't be too long when I had to leave, and I sat there and I waited. I could feel that a lot of the staff were avoiding eye contact and just in case I asked a question, and I didn't feel, feel very supported or cared for at all. And the truth is, this isn't healthcare. This is sick care, and sick care is very icky. We don't wanna deal with it. We don't wanna go to the doctor. We get anxious when we have to get a blood test and everything feels scary and out of control. We really just don't wanna deal with it until we're already dealing with it. But on the flip side, it's not just the patients. Our nurses and our providers feel it too. 78% of our providers report burnout, largely from working on their computers. They spend an hour documenting for every hour that they spend in patient care. And you know, at least us technologists asked to sit in front of a computer all day, they did not imagine this when they decided to become doctors. The American Medical Association defines burnout, this concept, as marked by depersonalization, exhaustion, and a lack of empathy for the patients that these providers are serving. And that's huge and it's really impactful because re research studies have repeatedly shown that warm, competent providers actually correlate with better health outcomes. So when you're thinking, hey Preeti, I thought you said you designed for the member experience, 
No, I design for both the provider and the member experience because at One Medical, I know that delivering a better provider experience ultimately leads to a better patient experience. So imagine a future where healthcare experiences are about human connection and that's what's brought to the forefront. Not all this like computer BS. Experiences that promote comfort and healing for the patient and help the provider get away from their computer and provide quality care and develop genuine bonds with their patients. That's what we're aiming towards. But in order to do that, empathy needs to be at the DNA level of, an, of our healthcare organizations. At One Medical, empathy is cultivated. It's not just a tool that designers use when they're out and about doing research. Today, I'm gonna share four practices that we use at One Medical to build this kind of empathy. And I'll show how we use a communication framework to have genuine interactions with our patients. Um, highlight how we spend time in our offices and how this as, uh, helps us as technologists really humanize our work. And I'll demonstrate how we partner cross-functionally to solve problems and the impact all of these pra practices have on our design work. I hope you'll be able to extract some of these practices and apply them to your organizations as well. So the first practice I want to share is called CI Care. And yes, it's an acronym. I don't know if you guys like acronyms or not, but this is so much more than that. Trust me. So CI Care is an interaction framework that we use at One Medical. And it helps us focus on genuine connection with, parent, uh, with patients rather than the scripted communication that's so commonly found in healthcare or in like customer service. The framework was developed uh, by our CEO and others at UCLA and at Stanford. And UCLA alone saw their patient satisfaction scores go from 30% to over 90. And it's not just about patient satisfaction, it's about wowing them as well. So CI Care stands for connect, introduce, communicate, ask, respond, and exit. So let's imagine uh, a front desk admin and how they might deal with a patient who's late. This is a very common scenario. You can very easily say, sorry, uh, we don't have time today. Please book another appointment. But what we'll do instead is allow that admin to make a judgment and start expressing themselves warmly. They recognize that being late is a human experience. We've all been late to something before. We feel terrible about it. But we got to move on. And the patient knows that they're running late. There's no point in bringing it up again. So CI care is about connecting with the patient and really meeting them where they are. So as an admin, I'll introduce myself and create familiarity. And that'll help provide a calm environment for the patient. So I may say, I'm so glad that you made it. My name's Preeti, and I received a heads up from Jane that you called and that you were on your way. So it's like a little micro interaction, but it calms down that patient. Next, I'll communicate my steps and be really transparent about that so that I can reassure that person. So I might slow down my actions and my words so they don't feel rushed. And I might even share my appreciation for the fact that they called uh, to give, give us a head up, heads up to begin with. Next, it's very simple to ask very simple questions during this initial interaction to make the patient feel like they're making progress on their visit already, even before they even see the doctor. And then I might respond with anticipation. So this is a practice of kind of getting into that patient's head and say, oh, I observe that this person is anxious and I want to respond to that sense by reminding them that the provider will be out shortly. So we can say, Dr. Smith will come get you in a moment. Please make yourself comfortable. Or we can also say, knowing that it's a late appointment, if we don't get to everything today, just come see me right after and we'll get it all taken care of. So these are micro practices, but they go a long way. We'll end the interaction on a personal note and express gratitude and just reassure the patient. And these little things help put the care back in healthcare. 
So this framework for empathy and interactions extends throughout One Medical. It's not just uh, our in-office experience. So it goes from anywhere from the way that we write our product copy to how our engineers think about their PRs to how we respond to fee uh, patient feedback emails. And the fact that it provides a common language for us all and it's observable makes it very easy for us to recognize good examples of CI care and really commend the folks who are like doing it in daily office huddles, as well as um, one medical town halls. And it's a mindset. So once you see it and once you start practicing it, um, it's very hard to not recognize it. So the next practice I want to share is a concept called going to Gemba. The word Gemba is a Japanese word, and it means the place where the work is done. So for us, this is our medical offices, right? We observe those doing the work, and that includes our admins, our phlebotomists, our providers, you name it. And with patient, uh, patient approval, we also sit in on, on, on appointments themselves. So this means that we observe interactions, but also how our providers are, uh, how the workflows are working for our providers with the technology that we've developed. And since this process is in person, it helps us really humanize the work that we've done as technologists. So everyone from our CEO to our executives to our designers and our engineers prioritize going to Gemba regularly. And by doing that, by sitting with them, by joining daily huddles, we're showing respect for the people that we work with. And not only that, we're learning and actively managing from the place where the work is done and not making decisions from boardrooms or from spreadsheets. So just our technology team alone, over 50 of our technologists have gone out um, to over five markets in 2019, and they have gone out and been able to see the actual difference between the people that we serve in San Francisco, the folks that we serve in Scottsdale, Arizona, or Chicago, and what processes are different or similar amongst these markets as well. They go to Gemba and they come back and share their stories with the larger technology team. Not only that, they come up with ideas about how to automate certain workflows, how to improve certain interactions, and how we can possibly give time back to our providers to deepen their patient relationships. Not only does this help us all align on the problem, but it helps us all invest, be invested in how we're trying to solve these problems as well. The truth is, though, no matter how much we try to observe or how much uh, we try to empathize, we can't quite fully empathize because we don't have the context or the experience. And it's really OK to admit that. In that case, the best thing is to invite the person and their perspective into the conversation. So the next practice I want to share is called a Kaizen. It's a participatory design approach that we use to solving problems. It focuses on a cross-functional approach to improving our internal processes. And by doing this, we show our teams that we care and that we want to help improve their work lives. And we know that improving our, provider, uh, our, our providers' lives as well as our admins' lives, et cetera, actually ultimately leads to a better patient experience, too. So, the word Kaizen is also Japanese, and it comes from the biz Japanese business philosophy, um, which talks about making continuous improvement through small incremental changes. And it originated from Toyota's lean management philosophy. So what a Kaizen is, is at One Medical, team members from various roles come together, and they're invited to participate. Um, so they're flown out to a specific market, often coming together for the first time and solving a specific problem through hypotheses, measurement, and iterative testing with the local offices. We hold at least one Kaizen a month and tackle lots of difficult problems, such as improving how we process lab results or reducing provider burnout in time spent on the computer or enhancing the patient check-in experience. But it's also important to turn these processes into action and outcomes. And so our Kaizen foundings, most of the time, have resulted in pilots that are, you know, 
put out in New York, for example, and there's, if they work, they're then standardized throughout the company. And one such model is an example of writing chart notes. So if you're familiar with healthcare, you've probably heard of the dreaded term soap notes. And that is the documentation that all providers have to do once they're done with your appointment. And it's the reason why they hate being on their computer. But from hearing provider pain points and perspectives, as well as literally measuring um, cycle time with a stopwatch, one of the Kaizen teams thought and hypothesized that prioritizing the assessment and plan as opposed to the uh, subjective and objective would actually be better for a, uh, for a team-based practice such as ours and that it would reduce the time the, pay the providers are spending writing these chart notes. The assessment and plan is really where the meat of it all is. So it's where the diagnosis is and it's where the next steps for the patient are. So they tested this out with local offices. So they timed how long providers were taking um, if they followed this new protocol. And they then uh, put it out as a pilot in New York. And as you can see here, teams have sustained a reduction in time spent on charting since this rollout for over 20 weeks. And it's, that's a long time. But this also means that providers have gotten hours of their lives back to spend on patient care. And so I just want to say, like, this is designed to, even if it's not designing a UI. And the last practice I'll share is empathy mapping. Um, it's, it's pretty common in the design world to begin with. But it's a great way to understand how our users are feeling before, during, and after their interactions with our products. Recently, I worked on a women's health project to expand access to IUDs for our patients. Um, especially, uh, so an IUD is an intrauterine device, so it's a form of birth control that gets inter inserted into the uterus. Um, and I was really excited to work on this project because especially with today's uh, political climate, I was very excited by this. But, so, my team and I gathered requirements, we talked to the nurses who do video consultations for this procedure, we talked to providers, we interviewed patients, we, we designed a UI, um, as well as a service design workflow. Everything was great. But as a follow-up, I then talked to seven patients who had recently, in the past month, gotten their IUD at One Medical. And instead of just interviewing them, I did an empathy mapping exercise as well. So, I had them recount what they were feeling the moment when they you know, were thinking about getting an IUD all the way up until the month afterwards. And I realized that in addition to the booking and in-office experience, there was a big part missing. And that part was our communication. We were not delivering supportive, effective, and reassuring communication after that procedure was over. And I realized our responsibility did not end at the point of providing care. <laughs> So from empathy mapping, I learned that the patients were largely really proud of themselves for doing the research, talking to their provider, getting that procedure done, getting to that appointment. Um, and they felt comforted by the provider the day of as well. So a few of them mentioned that even though they were nervous, they loved the fact that the providers would play music or they would teach them uh, breathing exercises or reassure them by saying things like, oh, I've done this procedure a thousand times, or this is my favorite procedure of them all. And actually, the, pr the procedure itself is very quick, fairly quick, and the patients appreciated the heating pad that the providers gave them afterwards in case they cramped. But this feeling of being very proud resulted, in the next month, it deteriorated to uncertainty and anxiety. Almost all the patients mentioned that there was a lot of ambiguity around recovery time. They were more surprised by the residual bleeding that they experienced for the month after than the, procedure, the pain during the procedure itself. And some even called our virtual medical team and did a video chat just to get some reassurance and make sure that experience was normal. It was kind of like calling mom to make sure things were okay. So I brought back this research to um, our, our, our team that was working on this project. And it was clear to the team that we needed to prioritize these communications and extend the scope of the technical work that we were doing. 
We worked with a provider team to create compassionate care instructions for both before and after this procedure was done. So immediately after the procedure's over, uh, the provider hands a sheet of paper with aftercare instructions to the patient, as well as uh, messaging them those instructions via technology as well. It's like a little micro interaction, but it makes a big impact. Um, the provider also says, hey, call me if anything, if you feel any discomfort or if you have any questions, or feel free to do a video chat with one of our nurses. And that also adds a little bit of comfort in feeling that you are able to call if you want. And so in this case, our team chose to focus on not just this technical project, but the overall experience of getting an IUD. And even though it expanded scope, it was the right thing to do. Um, and I think our decision was really enabled by our company culture as well, to go out there and be empathetic and, um, and focus on the overall patient experience. So early in my talk, I, thought, I talked about how our life experiences expand our capacity for uh, empathy. But I would argue that being a designer in healthcare has done the same for me. Not only that, I've benefited from this culture because I've benefited from my coworkers who've been able to show that same empathy to me when I was going through hard times. Overall, I believe that empathy is a muscle and we must build it over time. I think it's gonna be necessary for modern organizations to be innovative and competitive and to thrive. And it's important that we all think about how we can cultivate empathy in our organizations. So it doesn't have to be big. It doesn't have to be like a program. But if you're a designer, bring a non-designer out with you when you go do research, right? If you are um, at your company, go introduce yourself to someone who you don't know what they do and ask them what they do and learn about what they do. If you're a leader, like get the budget to uh, invite your team members to meet in person, go out and do exploratory research, and learn from their findings and integrate it into the roadmap. So there's a lot that we can do, and I truly believe that if we're able to cultivate these practices, um, we will have companies that are focused on continuous improvement and are able to develop genuine relationships with one another. Thank you. <laughs>